The cops came home, spoke to my parents, and said, "Listen, this guy is trying to pick a fight against one of the most powerful guys. It's like this person would come and want to play Hindi music. And when we tried to tell him, 'Don't do this,' he straight away took out a gun and he put it on my head. My other partner, he started beating him up. I went to help him. <laughs> this guy put the gun inside my head, which not inside my mouth, which had never happened, you know, before. <laughs> so." Welcome to episode one, season one of Millionaire Mondays, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that built them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, how Saurabh Sitaram turned a struggling startup into India's most well-known milkshake brand, Keventers. In 1889, a Swedish dairy technologist came to India. His name was Edward Keventer, and he'd been recruited by the British to modernize India's dairy industry. Five years after arriving, he took over a struggling dairy farm in Uttar Pradesh, and by using his understanding of dairy science, he was able to turn the business profitable. By 1925, his business was generating so much revenue that he was able to expand, opening a huge farm in Chanakyapuri, New Delhi. And this was just the beginning of the Keventer's brand. Over the next decade, he expanded from Delhi to Aligarh, Kolkata, and Darjeeling. Then, in 1937, when Edward passed away, his nephew sold the business to an Indian industrialist by the name of Ramkrishna Dalmia. Under Ramkrishna's leadership, the brand soared to new heights, becoming a household name among civilians for its milkshakes and milk, and also among soldiers as well. In the late 1960s, Cavender started supplying milk powder and condensed milk to the Indian army. Business was going well, but everything changed at the end of the 1970s when the government of India forced Cavenders to shut down their main plant. They were transforming Chanakyapuri into a diplomatic enclave and couldn't have a big dairy operation taking up valuable real estate. And so, with its Malchamarg headquarters out of commission, Ramkrishna focused his attention on other business ventures instead, leaving the Keventers brand to languish. And languish it did. For almost half a century, the Keventers name in India was kept alive purely by a handful of Keventers original distributors who chose to keep their outlets open without any formal recognition from the Dalmia group, with the most popular being the Keventer's location in Delhi's Connaught Place. However, in 2014, one of Ramkrishna Dalmia's grandsons, Agastya Dalmia, decided that he wanted to resuscitate the dormant family brand with the help of one of his friends, Aman Aurora, and they gave it their best shot, setting up a location in Delhi's Pitampura locality. Ultimately though, with virtually no experience running a quick service restaurant, the first new Keventer's location in over 40 years failed miserably. It was at this point that Agastya and Aman reached out to my guest today, Sorab Sitaram, a well-known Delhi-based entrepreneur and restaurant owner with more than a decade and a half of hospitality experience under his belt. So I thought, listen, nightclubs can be a great idea. And I said, and I had this vested interest. I said, yeah, listen, I'll have a band and I'll also play. What better? You know, I get to play also because the band was gone. Everybody is some way or the other. So I said, let's. So I started then for me, and then we we created a first nightclub where we said that people didn't just have to go to a five star to in in Delhi. And I think it was a very bold step. I can proudly say we were one of the first few people to actually do it. And this place was called No Escape. No okay. Escape, located in what uh, <laughs> what locality? And it was in the year two thousand, and uh, this was in Connaught Place, which is a very central area. Wow! But at that place, at that time, we didn't realize that okay, maybe South Delhi could could be a safer place. Delhi was still pretty lawless. What was CP <laughs> like at that time? <laughs> CP was nobody had heard. Everybody only listened to Hindi music uh, on the streets. There was just Bollywood. So we started playing, and we never played. We we just change it. We dare to be different. I can say. Did you ever face trouble from uh, what do you call them? Not in India, you call them gundas, right? Yeah. Uh, or <laughs> gangsters, or, gundas. Or, or yeah. as you say, like sometimes yeah. there might be some upset uh, politicians or police. Like, what kind of situation was it like? It must have been a little bit dangerous, no? It's it was very dangerous because uh, CP was not a safe area. In fact, in those times, nightclubs nobody appreciated because everybody night thought that nightclub is a it's. It's not the place where you want to send your kids. Let's put it that way. Uh, Bangalore at that time was very different. I was also very inspired by Bangalore because Bangalore had uh, 
you know, places like the club operating uh, till the wee hours of the morning, I remember. DJ Ivan was here, who actually changed the face. The kind of music that he came up with was unbelievable. I still remember those days. So we were, we really wanted to replicate that in New Delhi and in New Delhi, it did not exist. And nobody dared to do this. So there were many incidents because in Delhi, egos run very high. Uh, it's not a safe place. The cops are not with you. Cops are there with people who have money at that point in time. We had little money that we had invested in the business, right? <laughs> so it's not that we, we knew people. There were a lot of weird people who wanted to become our partners and they didn't have white money to invest. It was, it was that sort of a situation where everybody said, listen, we'll give you whatever cash is there. And we said, listen, how can we work with cash? Are you are you insane? We've all worked for corporates like Taj and what are you talking? <laughs> this is... <laughs> so first was this, the kind of people who want to come and become your partners when we did not want to become partners with them and forced us to become, uh, to work with us, okay? And in certain cases, you couldn't say no because the situation was such. Either that person could have been, uh, look, I don't want to reveal names here, but could have been very, very senior police officer, for example, <laughs> right? Or it could be someone who's a very dangerous sort of a restaurant, like you said, Gundas or whatever. So you didn't want to really face them off, especially when you've just started on your own. Uh, there was an incident. In fact, I must tell you, this person came and uh, he came inside and he insisted that the bouncers, because then we realized, listen, we had to add we had to have bouncers. Oh, in the early days, you, did, you didn't have... <laughs> we didn't realize. We said, but then when there were fights, so I would go and control the fight. <laughs> when you I were was the bouncer. It, I, look, you can... I'm not... You don't look I, like a bouncer. I, I, I don't look like a bouncer. So everybody would just pick up a plate and bang it on my head. Yeah, And I would be bleeding. It, it went to that extent. Is it? It, it, yeah, because it was... So then we said, what do we do? So we got the bouncers. Now I said, how do we get the bouncers? Now somebody said, you can take my bouncers. Now, we didn't realize that this guy himself will become a regular and those guys will be his bouncers, right? <laughs> so, so, so that guy came and started misbehaving every second day in the club. Now, what do you say to him? Now, when you're trying to tell him things, then he would get his bouncers and the bouncer attack us, right? It didn't matter if we were owners. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to say, so, so it became... Like pretty difficult to control certain situations. Like this person would come and want to play Hindi music. Now that was not a policy. Let's put it because we're trying to, not that I have something against Hindi music. It's just that a policy was different uh, at that point in time. I think you guys were playing like house, house music. House music, house music, right? house music. But what happened was, so obviously we started, uh, I mean, I've had incidents with this particular person and when we were, and when we tried to tell him, don't do this, he straight away took out a gun and he put it on my head. My other partner, he started beating him up. I went to help him. <laughs> this guy put the gun inside my head, which not inside my mouth, which had never happened, you know, before. <laughs> so Wait, the way you say it, it sounds like it happened again later on. <laughs> now, if you ask me, I know, I've seen so many guns at this... Uh, uh, you proximity. Know, uh, such proximity, I can tell you, which is the gun... <laughs> what kind of bullets are there? What does it taste like? Magazines. <laughs> what kind of a magazine is there? Whether it's just a revolver. <laughs> Which gun will actually injure me? Where can I be safe? <laughs> so, so, so it's been very different. I must have had at least, because in those times, like I told you, Delhi was very different. I must have had at least, I think, 10 to 15 incidents of a weapon definitely on my head. Okay. Or in different part of my body. So, and then we got, reached out to the bouncer saying that, listen, just help us. So the bouncer said, of course not, yeah, because they work for him. Yeah, <laughs> right. you're not the boss. So he reported the cops. Cops told us, are you crazy? Are you trying to tell us that you want us to do something to him? The cops came home, spoke to my parents and said, listen, this guy is trying to pick a fight against one of the most powerful guys. Okay, so please control him because he won't be... <laughs> these guys, he won't know where he's gone. They'll chop him into several pieces. Yeah. What, yeah, what did your parents think throughout this? You're setting up a nightclub. Were they supportive? or were They, they... Had, they had no idea to become like this, right? So to them, to them it was a, a, a nice restaurant that was open late at night. Is that kind of how you would have explained Absolutely. it to them? Where they could take their friends also and party, right? <laughs> so, so that's when we started getting some partners like I told you we got some influential partners we had no choice but to get them because it was much easier then 
then people won't uh, and we had to do something look every second guy can't tell us and give us two three slaps and say listen who who the hell are you so it was very difficult to deal with these sort of and egos were very high in fact i once i just told a person and there was this place that i was doing it was called tabula rasa it's quite a insane place and again i'm talking about the year 2003 10000 square feet delhi had never seen such a huge place at that time was this like your second uh, location that you that you'd set up or i think it was about fifth or sixth fifth or okay sixth. fifth or sixth location and uh, it's a very cool place we had the concept of small plates fantastic dj i think the sound was unbelievable it was just a pleasure if i went to tabula rasa i would finish by 9 o'clock 9 o'clock then uh, i would go and pick up at that time you know my girlfriend now my wife and then both of us used to go for golf so <laughs> so so i slept only at 3 in the afternoon or something so those were the crazy times but what i'm trying to tell you is that there also i just and i used to love getting into action so if the bouncer was fighting with someone i would love to go and see what's happening i think that's when i realized that you've got to keep to yourself in business and you've got to really what you're good at you start supervising people and let people do their job that's another learning that i got because i every time i would love to because i started like that right if people breaking beer bottles or people you are being say, oh, the bouncer God, wow right <laughs> so, so, so so but that's young blood what i'm trying to say is that uh, so slowly i realized and uh, yeah was it i mean were you guys making good money yes of course uh, so 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 that i must admit that the money was there because look there was alcohol and there were very few places in those times and we were kind of the trend setters so it was a great business i would say the rentals are not that high today the rentals are very high uh, uh people would come uh say in a restaurant you've got 50 covers i'm just covers means the uh, seats or tables so if only 50 people can accommodate in a night club the same 50 you could fit in about 300 people right because you we would in those days we would remove the tables and let people kind of swarm into the place you could take a cover charge you could have a uh and plus you built that business and that's actually that's where i realized that nightclub business is not this business of people coming and listening to great music and all they all coming with that intent to look their best and we we genuinely like that you know where people you could even meet your soulmate there you could even there were so many things that can just happen everybody says coffee conversations but i feel nightclub is the place where especially when you're young now of course even i find it odd yeah, to go to a nightclub <laughs> so, so, it's more so, of a nostalgic experience <laughs> it's more for that now i would go there to meet a soulmate right yeah. i would go to listen to some good music but but in those times things were very i i think when when you're younger there's different vibe all together and you can and you're working hard you're so stressed out in life at that age i mean there's nothing better than just vent out go out vent out some energy release it uh, I, i think it takes away a lot of your stress by the way I, I do believe, and I genuinely love the business. I would love to do another nightclub. By the way, mm-hmm. it's very unfortunate I don't own any nightclubs now. Uh, now the younger generation has come in and taken over, and I really and, and they're all very lucky because now in today's times you don't have all these things. You're not establishing something new. You're not trying to change the trend. You're not establishing a new culture. This is pretty much very normal now to go out for for people to come and hang out together. uh cops also okay everybody knows how to behave you you don't have to go there carrying a gun so so things are so different it's good to see but yeah. i can proudly say that what we did especially in delhi in those times i think we were even if i say so myself but <laughs> i definitely think that we were trend setters and yeah and i think that's the direction that your life has taken right you started with no escape and then over the years throughout the early 2000s um i think yeah basically all the way up until 2014 you were you were building these kinds of experiences for people right where they could go out and sort of have a good time escape for a little bit um and then you you did something that was very different right so these two guys agastya and aman sort of you know did you know I them got, did you know them before no i had no idea and i and that's what i say that when you do good and when you're invested in a business uh agastya is actually the guy who owned uh, kevinters yeah. agastya dalmia right it was in so, his family. so 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 the trademark is with agastya aman was a good friend of his and agastya and aman have been great friends from college days right and they've always thought listen let's do something which is uh they did something with football you know those those five aside so they've always been uh uh 
uh, I think they really have an entrepreneurial mind. They're, they're fantastic people, by the way. So my point is that, look, even for that opportunity to come, and today I'm saying that that was a good opportunity. It's because I've given in everything. I've worked hard today. You know, my wife and I were talking to somebody, my, my ex-partner, Tabula Rasa, and he comes in and we went Goa, okay? He had done, a, he's done a restaurant in Goa. So we were, we were there and then he did, oh, no, sorry, not in Goa, but we were in a party in Delhi, okay? And this, Ro, so Rohan, and then Rohan says, hey, you know, and we were just talking, I said, listen, so the, this guy works very hard, this guy very hard, but the hardest working guy I've ever met in my life is this man, right? And he, sorry, and he pointed towards me. So what I'm trying to tell you is, and then I say, yeah, that I agree because he had never, t no time for me. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is that wherever I went, I put in a lot of effort. Okay. Uh, it's just not about hard work, but it's also being there, you know, being there for the team, trying to develop concepts and being fully invested in what you do. And I think that's one of the reasons. So imagine these guys, they wanted somebody really good. And first they only wanted a consultant for uh, for for this uh, Keventers. And someone to kind of come up with some, uh, was it What some, to do because they had done something in- Some uh, flavors, right? Uh, yeah. Because you had been in the restaurant industry. Right. They had done something which did not click, uh, basically, because this was done in a location which was not the best location. Pitampura, and, right? Yeah, you seem to know everything, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was not the best location. And obviously, at that point of time, it was a little different about- so basically, they needed a consultant who could help them with that. And then I wasn't very sure initially about this project, primarily because, you know, I'd never done a QSR. So you can't blame me for that because I don't know what a QSR business is. I've always done restaurants. So that's how. But I did see a potential and I thought that the the, the kids at, at that point, the kids were wonderful. They were... They were how they, old were they, they at that they, time? They, they were just in their 20s. So, uh, so I thought that they had great vision and I said listen I've not been able to scale up the way I wanted to and everybody tells me scale 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 so so here's an opportunity okay so earlier I only consulted then I went with Agastya once and then I told him listen there are a lot of things which are incorrect for example I thought that the milkshake was very cheap it was being sold at 50 rupees packaging was not okay there were many things and that's when we discussed what about the recipes where did the recipes come from whose recipe was it uh, very interesting because a lot of these recipes came from the old world uh, tradition. All the classics primarily came from the old world factories. And now the most difficult part was when we tried to reach out to factory workers and people who were the supervisors. Unfortunately, 90% of them had passed away, right? <laughs> it's, that, it's that old because remember, they would be working in factories when they would be, what, in the 30s, 40s and we're asking them after maybe 50 years or 60 years. So it's, it, it, it was uh, very difficult, by the way, getting the recipes. So, but it's so interesting because we found something from somewhere which was handwritten. Okay. And then like there were no proper SOPs like you have today. And it was just unbelievable. And sometimes it was just passed on from a worker to a worker, right? Or from a father to a son who, who, who went there. So it's very interesting. So a lot of the classics and a lot of the classic recipes came from there. And then, of course, yeah, we all worked. I also come from an F&B background. I, I've run bars in my life, yeah. So I've been a mixologist. I've always had that interest. So so we used to just experiment and work on a lot. And then uh, uh, we also had the ability to reach out to some of the best people in the industry, primarily because of our restaurant background uh, previously, to reach out to some of the better mixologists, to reach out to certain people who are in the world of ice creams. Because milkshake, there was nobody. Milkshake was just... It's just like in some corner of the menu, you'll find milkshake, right? It's never like the primary item. It's usually yeah, at the end. Yeah. <laughs> usually at the end. That also you can't find. It has the same flavors, right? There's two, three flavors. Vanilla, chocolate. It's strawberry. not easy. But but that's what I'm saying. So we actually created that. Uh, let's talk about the brand a little. It was started by Mr. Edward Keventis. Somebody had come down from uh, Sweden. Uh India did not have a dairy technology at that time. So he was especially called by the government and he set it up. And and from there, it's history. Keventers did really well. And Keventers was into everything. Cheese, anything to do with dairy. Kasata, in fact. Kasata, Keventers was the first company in India 
to to create kasata ice cream by the way so so there were many things that happened and uh, the dalmia family bought the brand out in the 40s 1940s okay Ra- ram krishna yes uh, he is the uh, he is a legendary man uh, so so he he bought the brand and from there they ran it till the 1960s and like i said this person was one of the distributors and there were several other distributors uh, and and we for a minute don't have any malice or we don't have anything against the people because when we ourselves are not done anything about the brand it doesn't matter uh, and the fact is that yes they they kept the brand alive uh, uh, they ran it and they ran it well and uh, uh, we are super proud of that uh, uh, but the thing is in that avatar we couldn't have expanded you know it, it, it's that, that's being run in a very traditional old world sort of a way you can't now you, like how we are now today present in 81 cities in india we in dubai we in nairobi we in oman abu dhabi you couldn't have taken the brand in that particular way. so we did meet him and we explained things to him blah 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 then of course uh, whatever happened but uh, and the trademark was always ours that's the story when we decide we'll expand now we were all not very sure how do we expand it because we needed much more capital than what three of us could actually uh, put on the table and uh, i think even you in your experience uh, when it came to expansion like you had done limited expansion like yes. to, to go or to Absolutely. one or two other cities but never something pan india yeah so the idea of course was not immediately go to pan india i created a plan we, we met his dad went through everything and then finally and then i said listen there's a lot of potential i think that we can really make a mark and i can if i can put in the same effort that i've put into restaurants i think this is a good story and that's how then i said okay agastya let me also i'll also come in as a partner okay mm. and uh, let's do this yeah so we all put in money and uh, the three of us and we decided to grow the brand and uh, the first few that we did we did the one at select city we changed the location we said let's go to a better location so that people know us more and and by the way that was the first time that i ever tried uh, kevinters was at select city walk oh, nice. in 2017 i had no idea that that was your first location but i yeah. i just saw this this brand and i thought oh this looks kind of cool and yeah. back in canada where i'm from everybody was going crazy about mason jars so like these glass jars that yeah, you could like we had mason jars in tabula rasa so. yeah. yeah 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 it was <laughs> so, such a cool concept and yeah. and sort of vintage and retro yeah. but i'd never seen seen it done in india hmm. and so when i saw this brand i thought the name was a little weird you know kevin turns like what what is this even is there a guy named kevin somewhere that set this up is it a foreigner hmm. i couldn't really figure it out but yeah the milkshakes were good and i guess sort of that was the first location was the plan because i know you talked about franchising later on but was the original plan to sort of let all these locations be company owned you set up in select city walk and then the next location was was where no the plan wasn't there like that uh uh Look first of all there are certain reasons why we thought of franchising and I'll be very honest I said listen guys it's a great idea of franchise primarily because uh when you go to different cities you don't know the culture see it's a different thing I can go and live there for 10 days I'll never be able to know what a person who's lived there from his childhood knows right I may say I know everything about Goa but I know nothing I know and I've been going to Goa like since a very long time and I've lived 15 days there 15 days Delhi initially when I got married and stuff like that. I think I know Goa really well, but deep down I don't know it at all. I mean, you can't compare me to somebody who's lived in Goa. There's no way, you know? And lived from a childhood, not moved now. Oh, my second home is there and I'll move and then I know Goa. That's bull, right? You can't do that. <laughs> so so the thing is that we decided that let's take the franchising route for a couple of reasons. One of course is the capital, but that was not it's not we could have tried and got the capital. It's not that. I mean, bank borrowings were there. Uh, it was not very difficult for us to raise capital but we decided that look anybody and kevinter is a way because it's a grab and go model it's very location dependent you can even in a mall in the same space if you do it in the middle of a food court it could bring you more money or the sales could be more than if you do it at the corner but if you do it at the right corner where the people are coming in maybe it'll generate more but if you do it at a corner where nobody will go it'll generate zero money so what i'm trying to say is it is very location dependent it happens when sales are incidental so franchising we decided because we said we want to expand all over india 
and then we did our calculation we said okay it's a great business and abroad everybody works on franchising so why is it that in india people are so hesitant or people say so i would say that we were also there one of the trend setters where we decided that we'll we'll do franchising right, right? because yeah. i know like for sure. example in the united states right. franchising is just the de facto way of expanding like nobody even questions that that is the perfect best strategy to use whereas in india what was the what was the prevailing mentality uh, back in say Very 20, uh, 2014 so the thing in those times people did not want to especially private equity now things have changed like you've seen yourself but they were very hesitant to give money to to indian businessmen thinking that the money will not go into business but it'll go everywhere else especially in the pockets of indian businessmen and today which is a very sad plight of indian businessmen because today also these poor guys they work very hard but when it comes to secondary nobody gives them a secondary everybody says are all the money will go into the company so you see people raising the money that poor guy doesn't have a choice if he doesn't have the confidence in starting out he won't say oh i need some money in my pocket he'll want to pretend and say oh my god i want every money going into the company and blah 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 and that's the way i'm committed and stuff like that but it's wrong i feel that if somebody is working hard and you give him a salary which is half of what a corporate guy earns or even lesser i think the least you can do is give him secondary valuation and give him what he deserves when he's making 100x for you right <laughs> but that's the mentality it's just unfortunate people are selfish people everywhere people are selfish and the day they are not selfish you'll see businesses flourish like nobody's like there'll be such great entrepreneurs will come today entrepreneurs coming but they don't have a choice they it's like ha me ha milana like they'll say oh yes you you have to become the yes man especially if you need money so that's the thing and you just agree to any terms and you'll never be able to make money till the time that guy has made enough money if that guy has made 100x then you'll make money right now of course founders but but i feel that founders compromise a lot he's worked so hard every all his friends have lived a great life they bought bigger cars than him they 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 parted they roamed around that poor founder he he's worked so hard so hard so hard gained nothing theek hai after 15 years he's earned money or 10 years he earned it's like spending 15 years in jail na uh, <laughs> you go and spend this is 15 years in jail theek hai built a great product and stuff like that so i believe that you should enjoy life at every stage so if anybody comes with me i'll make sure that the guy is well paid he should enjoy he should be whatever secondary is required and if i can afford that 100% So coming back to this, this franchising thing. So that is why people don't trust uh, franchising business in India. Okay, but if you look at America, you look at McDonald's as a franchisee. You look at Domino's as a franchisee. So everything, the good products are there in India. All franchisees, right? <laughs> There's nothing. It's not that it's. Uh, That's how you go global as well. Exactly. Right. It's really important. What was the first uh, location that you guys set up that wasn't company owned and and controlled or a joint venture? Yeah so I'll tell you about it uh, what I want to just talk about is that the reason why we went in for franchising is also because we think that when somebody takes up a franchise I think it's a big responsibility that person is taking that person knows which location will do well and which will not people send their teams you know oh this guy BD guy and he'll go and what will he figure out he'll go there he'll see some crowd one day he won't live there throughout na he'll see some crowd there i think the best justice and somebody who can really find a great location is a local over there and a local who's got business interest not a local who's a broker and who's trying to sell you a location for a particular so that is why we decided to do franchising and that is how uh, and we gave up simultaneous franchises because we wanted speed uh we were very particular that uh when people are coming we we give a small ad in the newspaper and you won't believe the number of people that decide to come and take a franchise so we met everyone and we decided that we might be aggressive in business a lot of people say i think one our learning is that a lot of people they just sit on the business and they create these excel sheets i have nothing with excel sheets i'm also i mean i've created them many times uh but i don't sit on them and 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 then somebody comes and then they have these large meetings and 20 people come and they call focus groups when you've not even started a business and focus group and then they ask what do you think what do you think what do you are everybody will think differently right so i believe that initially when you do a business it's good to just have those one or two partners and you guys decide what's to be done instead of calling everybody and asking because then you will never launch your business <laughs> so when you want to do something you have to do it immediately yeah. so we've always believe that even if 80% ready i think 
it's time to move because that 20% can be achieved later and 100% though can never be achieved right so we did that how, so how like soon after you guys started in, in I 2015 think, uh, it took us two uh, we uh, one and a half years two years and then then we started franchising and franchising was immediate uh um like i don't even remember who took our first franchise right if i would because people took them same like somebody from calcutta took the master franchise then somebody from bombay took the master franchise that was like together uh uh and believe you me all the states in india were sold out i think within 2 months everything was gone <laughs> every every location was gone you get it and uh, and then of course there was a lot of learning in franchising also but every location was gone and so within no time we had created i think more than 400 plus outlets within no time uh and all very successful then he realized we had to have a great team great accounting team to get you know the royalties uh, other things and so franchising as per me is a fantastic business um but when covid came we realized that uh a lot of people were not financially uh, stable or they did not have the same kind of commitment that somebody from the company will have like us so what happened was that obviously those guys were facing losses in their own businesses right what they were doing or supposing it was a corporate guy maybe he was thrown out of a job and that was that is just unfortunate but that's how it happened right in those times so or the salary was reduced I think you guys were at what like 70 or 80% franchised uh across the country no, at that point. No, 90, 90%. 90%. Yeah. When COVID hit. Yeah. How many how many locations? I think and you guys were looking at like was it around 100 crores in turnover at that point? Yeah. Big, turnover was there. You guys were so, doing amazing. Yeah, yeah, we're doing we we we're, we're doing good job everybody and and 100 crores I I I'm, I'm talking about from the royalty fees. Yeah. We're not talking about the uh, the uh, you know the because in royalty what you earn from maybe 10 outlets you earn from one because you're earning about 6 7% out of the total revenue generated right so so i think that that was quite an achievement to be able to build something like that what what happened was we realized that during covid and it's just covid that changed it and what happened during covid was that we realized that because of this uncertainty a lot of people who were undergoing trouble or people who salaries were reduced by half or people they they said why should we continue if they had a franchise of kevinters they said yeah, listen anyway it's shut right we couldn't open it <laughs> for 2 3 months so you're paying the staff you're paying it's a lot of money uh, to be going we could sustain it right but but it's very unfair for us to expect that these guys will be able to sustain when the guys lost his job when his other businesses are shut who are we and we can't force them so what happened was a lot of people they came to us and started saying listen we are in trouble help us so we decided that whatever we could do at that point of time the best thing we could do was buy the outlet right but how did where did you guys come up with the money to to buy all these outlets because that would have been a really exp- like you have how many at that point we, outlets franchise did you have across no, the country no we we bought the outlet slowly and then the way we structured the deal was that we wouldn't pay them money immediately we would pay them over a period of time there were many things that we worked out it was not get just take the money and go right so we did all of that i think we did it very smartly and that's the money and we reinvested all our money yeah? what we had earned in kevinters we reinvested the money it's not it's not something that oh now we need the money call somebody will help us and now call the poor guy and show him dreams and then get him to invest the money and it was not like that so we put in our own money to this and people see that for what we've done so there was a lot of money that went out and kevinters was at that time then i mean we could feel the pressure there was a lot of pressure on us but but we never we never removed any of the staff everybody was uh, we said that one day this will also sail through it doesn't matter because if we do good for people it helps huh? and that is what we've done so it was our own money which was put into back into the business and majorly by you know whatever the so and people were very happy and today we've come to a stage where i think now we own uh, 70 to 75% company owned the rest are also there but we think that it's better because there could be another calamity there could be something else there could be another pandemic anything can happen so so i think that it's better that we own all the outlets rather than owning this 75% yeah so the idea would be to buy out all the other outlets also which we're doing mm-hmm. as and when back in 2019 
uh, I know that there was this this court case with one of your franchisees, right? Mm-hmm. Which also might have pushed you in the direction of thinking, is this really the right approach? Not that all of your franchisees are doing this kind of thing of of like sort of diluting or changing the product. Um, but was that sort of like a one-off situation with that guy, uh, that franchisee? Or it's a it's a one-off situation. And uh, let me tell you that franchise was he was a wonderful person, by the way. Uh, he was a great guy, and um, I think uh, he worked rather well with us. Uh, we we've shared some great times with him, and I, I, I and I believe that he's still a very nice guy. It's just that it was something to do with money, and there was a certain amount that was owed to us. That wasn't coming, and that's why there were some unfair statements which you, and that's not not even his fault because today, when there's a divorce case happening, and I'll just give you a simple example. The the lawyer tells either the grieved party that you should talk about these ten things. Actually, everybody knows that's never happened, right? <laughs> but but it's the lawyers who tell them what to say, what to do. It, very unfortunate. That's the way the world functions, and half the things have not happened, right? You you look at any divorce case, you'll figure out what the woman is saying or what the guy is saying. Oh, she did this. That's all bullshit. That's all orchestrated by the lawyer. Mm. I think that would have been one of the moments in the company's journey that was like the least peaceful, right? Where suddenly this thing is happening. And I think even like the the judge had said something about the the quality as well. Mm-hmm. I know there was, I, I noticed there was some people who were talking about that, right? Like that the quality Nothing, of exactly. Kevin Turs had sort even... of gone down and there was like, cheaper ice cream being used at some of the, the franchisee locations. Yeah. Um, whereas now I know the company is like 70%, uh, the locations are company owned, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. sort of a way that that Keventers can probably like- No, that was one of the reasons consistency, but it never happened, by the way. It may have happened in a few cases. That That's always the case when you give a franchise. It could happen. And also we couldn't monitor it effectively because of the pandemic, because you're not allowed to step out. It's just unfortunate, right? And that is the time when I said, because some of the people were, and you can't blame a lot of people because they are undergoing a lot of trouble in their lives. And when somebody is undergoing trouble, the person can take unreasonable steps. It's a very normal situation. You may take it. The reality of running a large franchised QSR chain is that if performance begins to suffer, then franchise owners may start to cut corners when it comes to ingredients. But how does the owner of a multi-city QSR business stop this from happening? Well, the only way really is to have oversight over what your franchise owners are ordering and how much they're ordering. And this is actually where this podcast sponsor, Explorex, comes into the picture. Explorex gives restaurant owners complete control and oversight over all of their restaurant locations from the convenience of their smartphone. And one feature of Explorex's operating system for restaurants called Bridge is their inventory management system, wherein purchase orders can be sent directly to ingredient vendors when stock diminishes. And a restaurant business owner can actually see if a franchisee is dropping below par using Explorex, which could be a red flag if the franchisee is using unapproved ingredients instead of the ingredients that they're authorized to use. And this is just one of the many things that Bridge can do for restaurant owners. So if you want to learn more about Explorex or Bridge, then click on the link in the description down down below. All right, now let's get on with the podcast. Today, if I want to set up a new business, I can just reach out to any of these franchises. They're all willing to come in, right? Not even one person says, oh my God, you're a, uh, you can do a court case on me, you're this, you're that, I'm not. Everybody wants to come in. We say, listen, we can't take so many. There's no chance. Right? Yeah. Right? Well, that's that's one huge asset for you guys is the relationship that you have with your, with your franchisees. I think another one is the legacy of the brand, the fact that People know Kevin yeah. Turs has been around since like the 1920s. Absolutely. And I think the the third thing that people know, and, and this was something that you guys established, was that sort of iconic glass bottle and the callback to the old days. I think that was really important. And it's actually, it's really fascinating to see how that same um, product style or or the packaging of the product has actually been emulated and copied over the years as well, right? I know... Um, not to say that they copied, but I know that there's another company that was started in 2014, Makers of Milkshakes. And then there was a company in 2017 called Frozen Bottle. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, those are sort of maybe some of the bigger competitors. Um, but there's also a lot of small local places, maybe one or two locations that are, I mean, it's sort of ubiquitous now, right? This glass packaging, this sort of really premium look to these milkshakes. Right. Um, it's cool that you guys were the ones that sort of pioneered that. Look, like I said, we always do things differently, right? And we don't think too much of money. I think that when you do good for people and you do something different, it just stands out. Yes, all these companies you mentioned, they've all got 
but everybody says na they have oh kevinter's bottle nobody says <laughs> so so you go to makers of milkshake you go cafe coffee day you go anywhere and you see that bottle you say oh kevinter's bottle is here also right nobody says cafe coffee day bottle no right <laughs> so for us what could be better right so we don't mind at all yeah we love when people use our bottles or it's okay it's absolutely uh, um, it's not affecting our business we are still the original milkshake and and look the mnc is what they did i always feel that you should good do good for people or for the society in general when your heart is in it when the government says ban plastic and you're doing it what's the big deal who are you here <laughs> you only doing it because the government has told you or somebody's put a head on your uh, a gun on your head and that's why you're doing and then you and then you changing it from plastic and they oh my god look at what i've done no oh, you've only done it because the government told you don't do this right the difference i think between us and the others is that we do it because we genuinely feel that's that time there's no pressure from the government don't use plastic don't use this but we genuinely felt that we should use glass because plastic is not safe it's not safe for the environment it's not safe for people the way it is stored in india it leads to leaching mm, you know stuff is coming paper all the trees are being felled there's hardly anything left in india what's going on here right so let's do a glass bottle and people told us the so called advisors and gurus are you guys mad why would you do this uh, you know when the whole world is doing plastic and look at the bottle um, it's so expensive it's three times the price or four times the price of and then you got to throw away the bottle but we said no nothing doing traditionally when we looked up historically traditionally uh, milkshake was actually served in a bottle and milk was always served in a bottle so we said that if we're looking at a brand which needs to be modern it needs to be we need to show india in a progressive uh, uh, manner we don't want to show india like uh, snake charmers were there or you know that what everybody does when they show india or a char pai is there or nothing like that we wanted to show india in a very progressive way so that's one thing but we we wanted to keep the nostalgia alive like it shouldn't be if we an old world brand it shouldn't be that we lose everything and the root is completely forgotten so we said that this is a great way and we looked at those dmc bottles earlier that were being served milk used to be served in them and we said hey let's try and keep a bottle which is very similar to that and if you remember those bottles used to have a foil there used to be a silver foil on the bottle of course that didn't work out so we got the other uh, and that is how we came up with the uh, the bottle so a but there are very interesting things uh, what we did to the bottle and also a lot of marketing that we worked on so number one one was the bottle itself which was a sustainable kind of practice now now everybody told us that you should recycle the bottles so we said why will we recycle the bottle and get into reverse logistics and all we realized people going to the gym people going they wanted to carry glass bottles but they did not want to carry glass bottles which were that size you remember the 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 1 liter bottle that's too much right so we said if we can create these 500 ml bottle which you can hold in your hand and when you're going in your car you carry these lovely bottles so we thought about that and we said that is how the size was decided by the way that people will be able to use these bottles once they are at home and if they're going to the gym and and we just imagine it like i said you've got to be you've got to be lucky also that people kind of do what you're thinking they should be doing but i think if you're able to plan it okay, this is what i want i want to make this happen it just happens <laughs> right we did that or at least you lead the way and very soon we had people all the gym goers picking up the bottle women they go into school to pick up the children they carrying a kevinter's bottle with water because they've already had the milkshake now they they using it for water right and i think a bottle is great because the water doesn't spill um, it's also clear glass uh, much healthier than drinking from a plastic bottle much uh, there's no leaching in india the weather is such leaching is very common but if there's no plastic there's no leaching and and remember the price of the bottle is also quite a bit the smaller bottle here you're actually getting the bottle free right you're going otherwise the bottle will cost you as much if you buy from a retail shop the bottle will cost you probably as much as the milkshake i'm just giving <laughs> so i i think that's another thing that really helped us third what we did was that we said yeah listen let's celebrate life on the bottle you can't just have kevinter's bottle okay so if there's diwali let's celebrate diwali so so then there's the diwali ka 
uh, whatever the Diwali got imprinted, maybe a rocket or a you know something that symbolizes or, or projects that it's Diwali. So it was Kevinter's and then Diwali bottle. So we celebrated festivals. Then we celebrated Easter. Then we celebrated something else. Then we celebrated other happenings around the world. So everything started coming on the bottles. And what happened was that it used to come for a month and then we used to change it again. So now everybody wanted what was printed before, right? So people started collecting these bottles. Then if you went to Bangalore, supposing, I, I remember we had written a code on the bottle initially because... But that bottle you couldn't get in Delhi. Now, if you went to Madras and somebody, you know, in a traditional dance form, that was there on the bottle that you couldn't get in Bangalore, for example. In Assam, what did we do in Assam? I don't even remember. Gohati. I think we had the Kaziranga Park. Or some, I think there was a rhino. I don't remember now exact, but something. You couldn't get that bottle here. So we made it like a, like something where... If you go to that particular state, then only you get that bottle. A collectible, yeah. A collectible. You can't get it. It's pretty much like a fridge magnet, right? You can't buy London fridge magnets here in Delhi. Delhi, you'll get Delhi at the Delhi airport, right? So I think this is what we did. Like in Dubai, we did the skyline of Dubai. In Nairobi, you did the big five. So everywhere that we did, and we kept changing it. Not that you've just done it there. You keep getting into the culture, find out what is it that people like, what are the various festivals, what can you put. In Dubai, in Ramadan, we do fantastic bottles, by the way. We do um, in, in whatever the other festivals. So it's like a very... So let's put it this way. Yeah? The inspiration is just to celebrate life. And I think life is to be celebrated. We all think that. And that is what our bottles symbolize. And that is why people love them. And that is why people take selfies. And what I'm saying is if there's a, like you asked me, you know, but others are also doing it, but they don't do this what we're doing. You get it? <laughs> they just have the bottle. That's it. That's not good enough, right? The soul is not there. <laughs> so that's what we do. You guys are sort of going in a couple different directions moving into the future, right? I know even pre-pandemic, you were talking about potentially making an FMCG push. You were also talking about potential plans to scale to London and Singapore, which I think might have been like, uh, that might not have happened because of the pandemic. Right. Uh, but going into different international locations, right. even potentially someday United States, right? I know you have talked about that in the past as well. Right. Um, so I'm curious to know where is, uh, what's the future of Kevin Tours looking like? And, and potentially even bringing coffee into the equation as well. Like, tell me a little bit more. See, the thing is that uh, with Kevin Tours, we are very clear. The next five years have to be... India will have a lot of expansion. Yes, we may have spoken about uh, other things. But we are concentrating primarily in India and the Middle East. Uh, these are the two, only two places. We feel that there's huge potential. Right now, we are in 81 cities across India. I think, I think, but all the cities are underutilized. We can do many more. Yeah, pushing right. into tier two locations I think locations we can easily do well. another 500, 600 more outlets in the next five years. Uh, we may not do those many. We may end up with about uh, maybe 200 or 300. But the idea is that the potential today to do Kevinter is about 1,800, 2,000 outlets in India. And uh, I don't think that we should go to other places as of now. Uh, so so like, like I said, things change, right? Especially when you have a new partner who comes in or things change. And for the better. Uh, but Middle East, we are there and we want to expand Middle East. We feel that there's great potential in Dubai. Dubai, we're already there in several locations. Uh, Oman as well. Oman. Abu Dhabi just opened a location. Uh, we are there in Nairobi, but we are not going to expand it too much. But that's a franchisee, by the way, in Nairobi. Two locations in yeah, Nairobi, two, right? Two, two, two locations there. They're both in the malls. And uh, Dubai, it's a 50-50 joint venture with a local partner. So, 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 so that's how it is. And uh, so, so right now, there's a lot of potential in India. So I think it's best to be here. We may go to another adjoining Bangladesh. I think that's another great, great uh, city. Uh, great, uh, it's a, it's a great country. I think there's lots that can happen there, but that's just. But right now, the concentration is only India. Okay. Yeah, because there's huge potential in India. Yeah. There's lots that we can do. Will you guys be going for an IPO anytime soon? First, we've got to understand what is the meaning of an IPO. Okay. <laughs> so IPO is nothing but borrowing money, right? If you're a profitable company, you may not want money, right? Are you, but, are you guys profitable at the moment? Yes, yes, profitable. We've always been profitable, except the COVID times. So, so yes, today, 
we are very ethical in our business so when we reach out and say that we'll be we'll be uh, we'll ipo it will only be to raise money and increase the profitability that we currently have it won't be to raise money to become profitable which a lot of companies do right for that matter or to uh, give an exit <laughs> or to give an exit to a pe we don't have a private equity we've got a great strategic investor who's always with us teaching us values learning from them and and it's vice versa uh so being an ethical company yes when we need money we'll raise but it'll be to grow the business and increase the profits and increase the revenue it'll never be to offset uh, uh losses what do you think of this trend though in the world of startups i don't know if you consider kevinters to be like a a startup or not i think it was a startup kevinters i i don't think now we can call it a startup i think because it's re- past that point i i think it's past that point yeah so there's a lot of startups though that are not like they're super loss making right heavy heavy burn um what do you think of that that trend i, I, I think it's changing I, now it seems I, like things are i i think the writing is on the wall to see the public is no longer if you look at the you look at the share prices look at look at the kind of share prices people sold uh, which i think was absolutely correct uh, sorry absolutely incorrect and people are gullible because they rely on on certain people and remember it's all about money which is what i say that look sometimes you got to use your brains sometimes you can't just keep watching tv i i think i was talking to you about this where people supposing i'm a uh, i'm launching an ipo and i just want to tell you first thing i'll do is i'll have lots of interviews on television and say what a great company ipo launching i want everybody to buy the ipo right i'll pay a lot of money to the broadcasters and i'll keep telling them make sure okay you keep talking about why our ipo is the best and how good our company is blah 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 and stuff like that okay <laughs> that's the first thing i'll do and you'll see every every one hour there'll be something which is oh my god you know this this coming blah 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 then i'll get all the influencers together and i'll tell them make sure talk about this particular ipo that's coming blah 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 and keep reiterating why it's the best what i'm trying to tell you is that and when we keep watching tv and when we keep when we're not using our own personal brains na we get carried away because it's not your fault also because if somebody is telling you it's like how you learn tables right you learn ladders five you keep repeating it over and over again it gets into your mind so that is what is happening but it's very important to separate yourself from that and if too much of it is coming on tv that means there's something not right <laughs> right if too much if if the world is only talking about why you shouldn't invest in shares and and the world is only saying oh my god fds are the most useless things you've seen na everybody says are yaar fd 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 you know i made my maximum money when i invested in fds and not in this bloody share market and mutual funds you know because it's such a safe investment and from i've been doing it from the beginning it's a lot more than what i made from shares and mutual funds <laughs> i'm just telling you and you look at any wise person he'll always do that i'm talking about but somebody wants to make short term money are now we'll invest in america we'll invest here we'll invest there and you're investing in companies which are all loss making companies for my in my life i can't understand why would you ever do that all the people who are making traditional businesses they are dicey you are investing money in a company look at the way the share prices have fallen from where to where this is great for people who are institutional investors who have invested pre but if you invest, <laughs> pre ipo investment is different it's very different but you don't have access to it and there's a bare minimum i think this 2 crores you need to invest so not everybody has access to that kind of money to be able to put in that's different it's a different game you can't be doing this uh, and i think it's very unfortunate you've seen the share prices drop in nothing public is becoming wiser and wiser to recover that kind of money that you've lost when you invested how will you and now nobody talks about na ke, oh buy the share buy that buy that because everything is monitored all you need to do is make sure you use your common sense why will you think if you have to invest in a company is the company profitable if it's not profitable why will you ever invest in a company right that's one thing 
you can't think about the future like this future may this will happen 10 years from now 10 years your life changes in one year what do you know what where you'll be in 5 years even i don't know i have no clue what <laughs> anything can happen in 5 years the world may drastically change the world may end for all you know anyway you lose your money then right an asteroid may hit what can happen what about you because i this is like i think this is pretty much the longest time that you've ever stuck with any one particular thing right in the past you sort of jumped around a lot this yeah. is almost a decade now right you know i jumped around because i realized that you could sell your shares and make money but with keventus what we want to do is make it into a legendary brand uh, I, i'm very keen so uh, and also remember i i think the camaraderie that i share with my partners the kind of partners i have i don't think i could have asked for anything more in life to be honest it's uh, it's very rare something like this that happens <laughs> so and all of us understand each other all uh, nobody is in your face nobody puts pressure on the other person listen do this do that this nothing it's just a very it's a fantastic environment and that's a company that we've already built with the environment of the company is lovely the camaraderie between people you know politics like how in every corporate company is not there it's a very it, it, there could be a little bit but nothing much you know it's a very where people are together and we like that generally i love that so i think i think for me also there's lots to learn even from keventus uh, so we want to make it into a legendary brand we've got a great partner like i said jubilant is coming with us and together with jubilant the what they've done with uh, dominos i think what we can do together for us sky is the limit so we are very excited we're launching new ranges we're launching new ice creams we're launching a lot of work is happening in new product development hot drinks as well right uh, hot drinks we've just launched uh, a vegan ice cream uh and and look it's strange for a company like ours to launch vegan ice cream because we're a dairy company at the end of the day but we've done it because not for any other reason it's not that we wanted to be cool and you know it's because people have reached out when we do think that some people are uncomfortable with the concept of milk and i think why should they not like our company we want to be liked by people and we really want to do it because we feel that we should give them a great product and we looked at all the vegan products and they were not great they were not tasty they were not so we made a product which they can be proud of today you ask any person who eats vegan and given the keventers ice cream compare it to any other ice cream you realize the difference there's so much r&d that we put into it and we worked with peter for this so so what i'm trying to say is that we genuinely and that is what people see in our company that we genuinely want to help people and we want to be there for them and we want to do the best for them right so so that is what is happening in keventers i i think that keventers is pretty much in times to come it will be it will be like one of the most recognized brands as for me the way we are going at keventers so 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 i'd definitely like to be a part of keventers <laughs> and for me you know start having started the journey from scratch it's it, it holds a lot of meaning for me i i i think the way all of us come together i'll never be i'll never want to do anything else i mean i i may do other businesses but but that's it we keep investing in startups we uh, between the three of us we formed a fund now so we're trying to put in some money into startups wherever we feel that there's a genuine genuine uh, because we want to help others and we can bring in a lot of value also if we if we help out for for that entrepreneur if he wants to raise money we can angel invest some money in but but we could also help him uh, you know structure larger deals uh, so 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 if somebody is doing good and somebody is uh, we feel there's potential we definitely help him That was Sorab Sitaram, co-founder of Keventers. And by the way, even though the company is a dessert brand and desserts are typically indulgent and very sweet, Sorab himself is actually very committed to making sure customers have access to healthier options too. So as a company we're taking this step, by the way, where we want to really reduce sugar without affecting the taste and we're working really hard on this. Very soon you'll see very less. I can guarantee you from 100% is going to come to about 20-25%. Um uh the the content of the sugar and we're working very hard on it like like you, you don't want like you don't want your children to be drinking sugar or eating sugar all the time or, and that's why you don't give them processed food uh but but that's an effort that we're making and uh, i think we'll be able to achieve it very quickly 
because our R and D team works day and night on this, and so are we. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the podcast this week, and I'll catch you in the next one.